Okay, so we're it's at three fifteen. So we'll um we'll just continue, and um we'll I'll be looking for new people who are joining us. So uh, this is for a, a little bit of an older group. So I'm sure that um. It'll be really interesting, especially knowing where the students are from, where they're from. They're in mostly in areas where there is a lot of water, either lakes or uh, there's Frobisher Bay with a Calouet or um, one of the oceans. So um, noise pollution is is one of the dangers of of. Um, of the environment and uh, human impact. So let's turn it over to Nicole and learn about some of the um, effects of noise pollution on the marine life. So over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Molly. So hi, everybody. My name is Nicole, and I'm from Ocean Wise Conservation Association. And here I am at the Vancouver Curia, which is located at the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including Squamish. Musqueam, as well as Tsleil-Waututh Nations. So, just now, Millie talked about a lot of you are actually living near the ocean, and there must be a lot of different kind of animals that you know or you have seen uh, around your area. So, feel free to type in any animals that you have seen or you have heard that is actually from your communities or your area, and let me know what kind of uh, animals do you have. Right now, beside me, we have a uh, skuna, uh, which is a sea turtle rescue from the coastal area um, near uh, the west coast of Canada. And she is actually belong to um, the tropical and subtropical area where there's a lot of coral reefs. Um, how about you? Do you have any animals that you have, you know, that appear in your area? Eels. A great one. How about are there any sharks or are there any beluga or even um, other tiny bit of animals that you've seen? Crayfish, narwhal. I really want to see a narwhal in my life, and I'm really, um, I'm really jealous about you. <laughs> and uh, we have Greenland sharks. That's a good one. Hmm. Some of you may not see any of the animals, but we do have a lot of creatures inside the ocean. And for Ocean Wise Conservation Association, we have scientists here, we have educators here, we have specialists here in order to learn more and investigate about the ocean. And because the ocean are resources as well as the habitat for all kinds of living things, including schooner up there, uh, including crayfish, sharks, narwhals, and even belugas. Um, so that's why we have dedicated team here in order to study and to make sure that we have a sustainable future for our ocean. Um, so for um, the ocean, we only know 5% of it. And then uh, for 95% of the ocean is undiscovered. And for our team here in the Vancouver Aquarium and Ocean Wise, um, they uh, specifically look at animals that is near Canada. And one of the animals that we are focused, we focus on is this one. It's a beluga whale. So I'm going to talk about um, a story between beluga and our dedicated team here in Vancouver Aquarium um, to tell you about their interaction, their research, as well as some facts about noise pollution today. So this is a beluga that some of you might see them or sometimes you may heard about it as some of the animals that you can see in Canada. So I'm going to hold it here and let you take a look at the uh, structure. So it's white in color with a tail. It's a toothed whale. That means they have tooth uh, inside their jaws. And these beluga whale do not have the dorsal fin like the other whales do. But instead, they are actually having a bumpy forehead here, which helps them to do echolocations. So I want you to think about what 
is at the location and try to type in one or two keywords that you know about at the location. So we have five seconds for you to type in. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. So some of our friends actually do not know about at the location, but it's all right because I'm here to tell you what's about at the location. So for two well, they have the ability to carry out echolocation in murky, very dark water. So because the water near near them is actually very dark and full of mud and it's not very clear, not very transparent. So that's why they have to do echolocation, that is to do something with sounds. So it's all about uh, the bumpy forehead here. So for beluga whale, this part of the body part is called melon. And what they do with the melon is that they try to mobilize the whole uh, fatty part here uh, on the forehead. And they try to emit sound clicks in order to locate and help them to navigate. So for echolocation, after the beluga actually emits sounds, those sounds wave will actually travel in the water and hit prey or hit the habitat near, uh, uh, near the beluga. And after that, those sound waves will bounce back and reach the forehead of the beluga again. And by doing so, beluga will have the ability to estimate the location of the prey or even the habitat as well. So that is how the beluga actually uh, communicate, navigate, and try to find their prey. And for our scientists, they really want to know more about the beluga well. And so we have a team of scientists that are actually going to um, Canada, the coastal area of Canada, especially on the east side, in order to invest Beluga well. So let me show you a map and you can see where will scientists go. So in, we are actually uh, now in Vancouver, is on the west side, but um, the scientists actually travel a long way to a river called St. Lawrence River. There, there we have a population of beluga whales uh, living there. And what they do is they have interaction with, the, with different individuals. And I'm going to show you um, a picture of the beluga. And this is taken uh, in the Lawrence uh, River. And this is our scientist, the lead scientist of the team and is uh, she is called Dr. Vangara, and she is uh, an expertise on beluga whale, especially uh, trying to investigate about the interaction and also the sound um, of, the, of the beluga whales in St. Lawrence River. So what they do is that they actually try to uh, locate themselves in the middle of the river like this. So they set up a platform uh, in the middle of the river and they try to set up a lot of cameras in order to spot those beluga well. And sometimes they will, draw, they will actually use drone in order to take aerial photos in order to capture the moment where those um, beluga well are interacting with each other. Um, because of that, they can um, get a lot of information about where the beluga distributed, how many of the individuals are uh, being there in the river, and what kind of interaction do they have. And sometimes they can find a lot of beluga staying together, and we call them a pod. I'm going to show you a video about how they actually interact with each other. Um, there's two adults beluga, and in the middle uh, of the video just now is uh, half. 
And it's very small and is very easily identified by those um, scientists. So for the scientists, after they know about um, the interaction of um, lugans, they want to know more about how noises under under the water could affect those beluga's life. So that's why for Dr. Bangera and her team, they actually place a lot of hydrophones under the water and try to listen to the sound uh, inside the water and try to I identify and try to analyze all those sounds that is recorded. Um, so I'm going to share with you um, a sound cl a clip of um, Beluga Well and let you try to uh, really listen to it for a, a moment. So bear with me for a moment. All right. Yes, listen. May didn't need to turn off your microphone, Nicole, so so they can hear that. Yeah, sure. That be no, still can't hear it. Okay, let's try again. Um, there's some background for a uh, background sound for the, the recording as well. But um, if you listen carefully, you will hear some whistles, sounds, and click emit by the beluga whale. So for um, the scientists in our team, they actually pay a lot of attention in order to identify all those sounds. So sometimes they can stay on that platform for a very, very long time, like a day and with, without getting any results. But sometimes they got a lot of sound clips that um, um, the scientists would love to identify them. So um, for uh, Dr. Banger up, they, they try to analyze all the sound and they find it very interesting because by listening to those sounds, they can actually um, try to identify whether those beluga are males or females. Is that the sound for me? Let me check. So besides that, um, Dr. Figueroa actually found that for beluga whales, they have kindergarten just like us. So what they do uh, is that the beluga try to group all those juveniles together and there will be nannies swimming around. And these results or this finding is actually come from a hydrophone because um, for the juvenile beluga, they only emit sound within a very narrow range and it's very um, easy to be identified by citizen, uh, the scientists there. And by listening to the hydrophone, they realize that there's a large amount of juvenile belugas that emit sounds and they keep on talking and talking and try to learn the language by their elders, just like us. And there occasionally there will be nannies emitting sounds, but um, for that environment, after taking, uh, after uh, comparing the results with the pictures that taken from the drones, they can actually found that this, uh, this is actually the kindergarten. And they also be able to find out that for um, the beluga, they have different frequency of voice. So for a lower frequency, that means it's actually trying to communicate with different individuals. And if they have a higher pitch of sound, they're actually trying to locate prey as well as um, 
trying to locate different uh, the, the habitats uh, using echolocation. And one fun fact and one, one cool fact that Dr. Wenger found is that for beluga, uh, males have a lower frequency. That means their pitch is much more lower than females. So by analyzing those uh, sounds, they are able to really know about the population. So I can show you how um, Dr. Fenger actually trying to do in order to um, know more about the beluga. So bear with me for a moment. So here we go. We have a picture of Dr. Bangara, and she is on a boat and listen to the hydro, uh, the sound emit, uh, recorded from the hydrophone, like every second in order to figure out what the beluga are doing. And after that, when she is back to the lab, she will try to take a look at the sauna um, graph in order to analyze all those sounds that they have collected. And sometimes they will find something really, really uh, fascinating. And one of them, uh, actually about how those uh, have, as well as the mother beluga, are actually try to interact with each other. So um, for the mother beluga, uh, they will try to emit sounds and click to um, their, their little kids using um, sounds and click uh, under those murky water. And the sound is just like uh, we how we rub the plastic calm in a, a rapid way. So it's the similar sound to those uh, beluga whales that is talking to their kids. And uh, for the beluga whale, they're actually facing some threats because um, there will be sheep, uh, shipping goods around, transporting goods around, which makes a lot of noises as well. And it actually affects the communication between calf as well as the mother beluga. Uh, for a lot of time, uh, for a lot of results, it shows that um, those pollution, uh, noise pollution and also that uh, under noise, underwater noise are actually affecting uh, how the calf can locate their mother. and um, Mother is very important for a little kid because they have to learn how to uh, locate food, try to how to uh, really communicate with other individuals as well. So with those, uh, with those noise pollution, they hardly communicate with the mother and the calf population will die eventually. So I want to share with you um, a soundtrack of the sheep as well as um, the well in order to have a little uh, comparison. So I'm trying to make it sound uh, over. Okay. So for individuals, they will have sounds like this. For the uh, for a noise pollution that emit from sheep transporting goods around the world, it sounds like this. And it kind of cover the sound of the communication between all the individuals and as well as to affect those echolocation too. So um, it's really the thing that our scientists, including Dr. Vengara, try to investigate and try to think of ways in order to improve the situation. And before jumping to um, the conservation message or um, talking about how we can protect them, do you guys have any questions so far so that I can answer that for you before we jump to the next session? Um, Carrie would like to know if you can play that last um, audio clip again, please. Sure. So for the last one is um, the pollution coming from the ship. So let's listen to it.
And then I will try to uh, play one more time for the individual sound clip. So listen carefully, it might be a bit loud. For the lower voice, it could be um, uh, the communication between individuals. And if it is for um, the higher pitch, it will be helping the beluga to find food and have questions. Cool. So we have some, do have some questions. Why are belugas white? Cool. Uh, it's all about natural, uh, natural selection and also evolution. So um, for the Juvenile beluga, they actually born in a gray color. And after that, they will get rid of the pigment and then it will become whiter and whiter. And it's kind of an adaptation <laughs> for the beluga as well. So because they live near the ice, uh, which is very white in color. So they kind of want to blend themselves into the environment so that to protect themselves uh, by being eaten by the killer whales or even polar bears. And I saw a question from Carrie again. Uh, how long do belugas live? Um, so for beluga, they live uh, the age until um, 30 to 50 years old. Um, so um, they are trying to uh, really reproduce uh, as uh, for the best and then try to, um, try to reach for more nutrients and try to uh, try to raise their young ones so that their population will get uh, very steady and stable. And Gibbler notes that he never knew how much noise pollution can affect the environment. So that's, that's like one of those aha moments. So excellent um, comment there, Gibbler. Uh, what do belugas eat? You said they were toothed whales. So what do they eat? So for beluga whales, they are toothed whales. Um, and they have the ability to really use sounds in order to locate a prey in murky, dark environment. So they will eat arctic char and arctic heart in order to food, uh, to get nutrients. So uh, from my knowledge that every day they need to eat uh, around 21 kilograms of fish in order to satisfy their needs. That's a lot of food. And Tristan wants to know, is that a beluga actual or is it a fake? Uh, this is actually a, a stuffy that I have, but uh, it got, got all the structure that a beluga should have. No dorsal fin with the melon hat here. And then the, there is flippers as well as a tail with white color. So they are all the adaptation that beluga will have. And I have a question because I it we you've answered the one about how they live. Is it true that they're the only whale that have lips? Um, yeah, they are actually having lips here, and then they are able to move the lips in order to make different uh, different uh, to show the emotion as well as to uh, communicate with each other too. So they try to use this uh, the mouth in order to uh, communicate with each other. And that's a fact that I learned um, not too long ago when I saw a video of some of a beluga playing soccer with um, some boats up <laughs> in Frobisher <laughs> Bay. Um, so let's see, are there more questions about belugas? Everyone seems to love belugas. They're one of those um, mystical, magical whales. And we've, you know, learned the song from Rafi, Baby Beluga, from the time we were little. And, um, but we don't know a lot about them. So thank you for teaching us so many facts and also about um, how noise pollution can affect them and, and can interfere with their family. So thank you so much, Nicole. You're very so much. Are dolphins, Elena would like to know, are dolphins cousins to belugas? Oh, 
um, for dolphins and beluga, they are two different kind of uh, animals, but they are all mammals. Um, they are all living in the ocean, so um, uh, they're not from the same family, but um, they have uh, the same characteristic for mammals too. Hugo would like to know, do they swim behind boats? Oh, sure. So um, usually they will swim freely uh, near the river and also up the Arctic. And um, uh, they try to swim as far as they can uh, using their uh, ability for echolocation to locate all the uh, boats. Uh, but sometimes boat is of very high speed and uh, sometimes for beluga, uh, they might not really notice that fuss or even it pose threat to those beluga uh, that the, sh the, the boat or ship might bump on them uh, if the beluga cannot escape right away. So uh, I know that for dolphins in um, Southeast Asia, they have a lot of high speed boat nearby and the number of dolphins die rapidly just because of the bumping of the ship. Excellent. And um, how far, two questions sort of in one, is a beluga a whale and do they, how far can they see? Uh, uh, I would say for beluga whale, um, the eyesight for them is not that good. I um, do not have the exact number of how far they can see, but mostly they do not use um, their vision as the main a method in order to find our food, but instead they try to use echolocation and try to communicate with each other. And for a beluga, um, they are actually a whale. Um, for a whale, they have a tooth whale and also as well as a baleen whale. Uh, for a baleen whale, it's like um, blue, uh, blue whale as well as gray whale as well. Uh, but for tooth whale, uh, a very classic example would be our beluga and also now. Right, and the narwhal has that big tooth. And maybe our last question, do belugas travel far distances to follow the seasons? Yeah, so sometimes they will do migration in a pot. That means they will move to some warmer place in order to find their food uh, in a big group so that to reduce the chance of being eaten by killer whales and they can communicate with each other whether there will be food uh, somewhere else. Yeah, so they will travel a great distance and they are migratory animals. Thank you so much, Nicole, for letting us know um, a little bit about more about belugas because they are one of those elusive kind of um, marine mammals that we don't get to see very often, um, partly because of their habitat but also partly because it's just not where um, where we live. So Georgia says, thank you. Carrie says, thanks. And um, just a reminder, boys and girls, tomorrow we have another great lineup of sessions, a lot of, uh, actually a lot of science because in the morning we have hissing Madagascar cockroaches. So if you ever have wanted to see a hissing Madagascar cockroach up close, this is your chance. And we are going to meet one of Nicole's colleagues who, who works just north of her from the Alaska Sea Life Center, um, talking about puffins and um, animals that live in burrows and bubbles. And then we have food chains. So you're gonna see some really awesome, another bunch of animals, including a real live tarantula that I swear is as big as your head. Wow. And then, oh, I know. Yeah, so uh, I hope oh, it's not done yet. And then we also have um, more with the Royal Terrell Museum with geology and family Zumba at night. So we've had a busy day today and Nicole's had a busy day today teaching us about coral reefs and about belugas so thank you so much and we hope you guys come back tomorrow and tell your friends and um thank you have a yeah, and I do have something to want to say so uh after learning about beluga I encourage you uh not only to search uh, to listen to um the program that we have or a connecting off that we have 
Uh, but you can actually help with the environment too by doing citizen science program. So uh, one of them actually I recommend to you is Orca Sounds. Yeah, that you can actually stay at home and try to listen to sounds underneath the water and try to record all the sound that you have listened about an orca well and send it to scientists. So do check out that link too. That sounds really great. Did you just see the race swim back there? Like it was just above your head. It was awesome, Nicole. Yeah, I would just want to take a look at them during my lunchtime. <laughs> Well, thank you so for so much great information and we're going to put those resources on the website as soon as we have our resource page. And thanks Hugo for joining. Glad you got your sound and video to work. And uh, so yeah, we'll see you guys later. Yeah, I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday. Bye. Thanks, Georgia. We love this too.